Hello and welcome to a Sunday night edition of the Managing Madrid podcast. I'm your host, Keon Savani. I'm joined by Ewan McTeer, who has just stepped foot in his apartment from the Bernabeu. He has attended and seems to have enjoyed Real Madrid's home games this season so far. We're only two, two home games in, but uh, the new Bernabeu seems to be coming along. Another W, and I, I can't really think of a more classic Real Madrid game than to come back after the international break, concede a goal early, fan base is panicking at halftime, and then we turn it around with a couple goals and everything is okay for now. And Ancelotti gives a speech like, well, I'm glad that we were able to win, but we should probably get better at starting games. The classic Zidane speech where he's like, we know we have to start better, but even though we know it, we can't for some reason. So we're going to break it all down. Classic Real Madrid win. You and McTier, welcome to the show. How are you doing, man? Yeah, good. Um, yeah, like you say, just back about four or five minutes ago in the door and and ready to uh, to go through what was pretty much a same formula win from the Hitafi game. You know, go behind, win to one, everyone leaves happy and, uh, you know, it works for now. But as you said, uh, maybe, Angelotti put it perfectly, uh, maybe we shouldn't start our games 0-1 and that's probably a good, uh, I think even the Angelotti haters can get on board with that. Well, um, after the international break, you know, we, we sometimes we call it a trap game where you come back and, mm. you know, especially the players from South America might be, you know, in in the couple years past. And even under Zidane, like it, it was pretty normal if a player comes back from South America specifically, they may not play that first game back. I think given that Vinicius is injured, um, probably we have less luxury to 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 maybe rest somebody like Rodrigo who played both games with Brazil. But um, so I was just kind of looking at that. Mind you, Fede Valverde, obviously coming back from South America, was fantastic and scored the equalizer. Um, what was your assessment of how like the the first like really the first half, but especially like the first 10, 20 minutes, it, we were really struggling. I mean, we conceded the early go- goal and then Kubo has a disallowed goal. There was also a, a, a huge chance that fell to uh, Baranechea, an, another one that he didn't actually score. Um, so I don't, like, what, what what was happening there? Like, what was your assessment of, of why Real Sociedad were dominating that, those opening minutes? Well, I mean, we saw Real Sociedad dominate, but we've also seen other teams this season and other, uh, last season too. That first 10, 15 minutes at the Bernabeu, it's not... It's not scary anymore for other teams. I don't know why, but we've seen this so many times. You see the ball. It's like if you're where our seat is, you'll know the one at the in the in the press row. We're slightly to the left of the the halfway line. That's the perfect place because that's where all the football happens. Because the first half, the away team have arrived and they're feeling good, they're confident. Real Madrid are starting sluggish, and it's all taking place at that side. And then the second half, when Real Madrid decided to do remontada time, it's also all taking place on that same side. So um, luckily, we're not way over on the right where nothing seems to happen. So that didn't surprise me at all in terms of what Real Sofidad were doing. I mean, like they were just getting the ball to Kubo, who is in amazing form, like three goals already coming into this game, could have had his fourth there. He's creating, he's been, he's really stepped up in 2023. Um, just the calendar year, the only players with more goals than him in La Liga is Lewandowski and Griezmann. Like he is an elite top level player in La Liga right now. And Real Sofit had fed him. And Ancelotti pointed out that the, the goal, the sort of Kubo gets the ball, he comes inside a little bit, he plays a ball into the box. He said, We knew that that's Real Sofidad's go to play. We studied that, we talked about it, but sometimes it still uh, comes off. And that's, you know, <laughs> so. It, I don't think it surprised anyone, even in Real Madrid. You know, they, they've seen Real Sofiad play like this. They knew what to expect and they just didn't stop it for, I don't know, like, I don't think it's anything tactical. I don't think it's anything technical. I think it's almost uh, attitude, starting games slowly, lethargic, maybe international break. But I'm even not sure I want to say that because we've seen this in other games before the international break too. It's five goals, sorry, five games they've played this season, they've conceded three goals. The times of those goals were minute three, minute five, minute 11. It was mm. also, remember, the Celta Vigo disallowed one for the, the foul on Kepa. That was in the fourth minute. That could have been another one. It's like, it's a pattern that is, you know, quite worrying, I think, and 
comes down to, I think, more of the attitude than any specific thing that the opposition does because it's happened against several different types of teams now. That's interesting that you, you kind of laid out. I didn't really fully realize until you laid it out with the, the, the minute that those goals were scored, the ones we conceded, how early they actually have been. But, you know, yeah, you look back on the patterns of the season, that's really how it's gone down. I also think, and I mean, in the case of today, um, especially, because, I mean, obviously, the difference between Real Sociedad and Getafe, while the score reversal was similar, mm. um, there's two wildly different styles of football. Maybe and the think, most different, yeah. Yeah, com- complete polar opposites. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, I think with Real Sociedad, what may have happened is that they ran out of gas um, mm. because they were pressing quite high in the first half and they were playing with a lot of energy. I mean, it started early on when Kepa had to kick a ball out of bounds because he was pressured. Carvajal gave the ball away. Carvajal, who was fantastic and had like maximum two mistakes in this game, that was one of them. And so they were they were playing pressure early and it was such an eventful game. I mean, even you think back to when Baranechea scored in the fourth minute, uh, after a Kubo, a great pass from Kubo, which actually didn't, I don't think actually counted as an assist for him because it must have been, yeah, it wasn't a direct um, shot after the pass. But the uh, surrounding moments of that goal, just before that, Alaba makes that flying run into the box. Bellingham passes, it was offside. Oh, no, it wasn't offside. I think, or, or maybe it was. It was offside. And he shot it, and Ramiro saves it. And then Rodrigo has a great chance in the box and Baranechea scores. Like So within like the first five minutes, there's actually like three really good chances and it was very eventful and the first half flew by. But I thought you would like, we might as well talk about Kubo because he is a big storyline from this game. Less influential in the second half, but uh, I thought like, so I don't know if people have heard us talk about him much because, you know, when we talk about him, it seems to be in niche moments like when we're watching a, uh, you know, a Real Sociedad game or, and maybe people aren't paying attention to it. They will pay attention to it now, obviously, because it was a game against Real Madrid and we're talking about the post-game show. But what I've been impressed with Kubo in particular has been, if you think back to his Mallorca game, like early on, um, some of his Villarreal games, even though like it was a very brief stint that was disastrous, even the Getafe stint, he was always brilliant with the ball at his feet. Like, if he wanted to turn out of pressure, he was very silky, very elegant on the ball, good dribbler. But the final pass, the final shot, always was, like, either the wrong decisions or, or poorly executed. This season, and not, I would say even last season, but this season in particular, it's, it feels like he's really taking a leap in that regard. And I felt like, it almost felt like he was floating in the first half. Like, he was just floating around and transcending, and the game was just flowing through him. Um... And I know you kind of wrote about him in your post-game piece, but what what is your take on Kubo overall? And also, you know, obviously fans are interested in the piece of like, does he have a future like at Real Madrid to bring him back? Like, is that is that possible? Is that gonna happen? Is it realistic? Is it smart? Like, what do you think? Yeah, like so the Kubo thing's interesting because I feel like now the last few years, every time he comes to the Bernabeu, every time Real Madrid play him, it's always, oh, the, remember Kubo? We liked him. He was really nice. He never really played for us, but like he had that preseason, those memories. He got on well with everybody. Like, oh, Kubo, we like him. Maybe one day he'll be good enough to come to Real Madrid. And it was like, you say, at Mallorca, Villarreal, Hattafi, it was never quite that level. It was always just interesting to see oh, Real Madrid's playing Kubo. This, this week, I think, was different. Like, this week, doing a lot of the preview stuff for this game, I think I wrote about three or four different articles where the focus kind of wasn't even really supposed to be about Kubo and it just became Kubo. It was just, this was, this is the guy because he had a great August, had, a, as I mentioned, a great 20, uh, second half of, of last season. Real Sofidad, he's really stepped up and I think it's like you say, he maybe had everything except the decision making and now he's working with one of the best coaches in La Liga, Imanol. He's in a team that it all just kind of fits for him. I mean, in Mallorca, maybe he didn't make that pass because, well, who was he crossing to? This is, remember, before Mariki, this is not some very good Mallorca, Hitafi teams that he was on and now that he's in a proper team, uh, you see this with certain players where they need to go up a level to show just how much 
uh, they can give. And maybe when they were playing at a lower level, they didn't actually stand out as much because they need to be surrounded by good players. I think Kubo is one of these guys for sure. And he's now, I think, for the first time, and I think I've written the kind of question of, oh, you know, Real Madrid just played Kubo. Should they sign him one day? I think this is the first time where I think it's a genuine question of, is he Real Madrid level? I think he is now Real Madrid squad level. Is he better than Brahim? Yeah, I think he's better than Brahim. Like, I think he could absolutely be in the Real Madrid squad and be uh, a right wing, come on for Rodrigo in certain games, start some games. Like, for sure, he's at that kind of level. Then you have the financial aspect. But I think now, finally, we're talking about Kubo being at that level and leaving the burn about today. I mean, this only cemented that he was just absolutely brilliant. The goal, I didn't see the goal at first. I didn't realise it touched um, Oyarzabal. And then mm. you see it had a little deflection. But I think if Oyarzabal is not there, that's going in anyway. So yeah. he was just um, superb. And kind of just to finish on Google, what you were saying about the transcending, he really did seem like the leader of the attack. Oyarzabal was a captain. He's Real Sofit had through and through, been there since the Youth Academy. It was Kubo who was the one pointing, shouting, marshalling everybody around, which you never saw from Kubo. He was always quite quiet, um, not because of the language. Right? He speaks better Spanish than most people I speak to every day. He's been in Spain since, you know, um, La Masia days. He's been here for so long. He speaks perfect Spanish. He can be vocal in the dressing room. They always say that about him. But on the pitch, you never really saw it. Today, and I imagine in other games, in, in, if you go and watch uh, him play in San Sebastian, this was the first time I've seen him live in a, in a long time. And... This was a different Kubo. This was a guy that was shouting, marshalling everyone around. Oyar Sabal, Baron in the chair, looking back to Marino and the guys there and really just felt confident, looked like a leader. And he's still only 22. He looks great. I mean, uh, I think back to the preseason. I can't remember exactly what year it was, but it was, it was 19. Like, that, yeah, he was part of the preseason tour, right? That's when we first signed him from Barca. Or, or not directly anyway, but you know, we first signed him. And I remember Modric being vocal about like, wow, this guy's really, really talented. And we were also excited about him. And I think he had, you know, the Villarreal stint didn't go so well because Emery uh, was not too impressed with him, gave him some tough love. Getafe did not seem to suit him at all. Um, so I'm, I'm, I feel like, I, and maybe this is a bit of a tangent, but I really like Real Sociedad. Like if I had to root for another team, it might be them. And maybe it's just a phase we're in now because, you know, they did such a good job also handling Odegaard, um, who, yeah. you know, now they get Kubo, who just kind of slides in and kind of replaces Odegaard in that sense. Aguasila is fantastic. Like, I would send anyone there to Real Sociedad to develop under his wing. Uh, I, I like that we have a good relationship with them. Um, so it's just a, it's a, it's a fun team to root for, and in my opinion, it seems like a fun place to send your players um, and but I also I wonder like to the question of bringing Kubo back I think it's I understand it's easy especially after a game like this and after a season like this to say oh we should have should have just brought him instead of bringing Brahim back or uh, or signing Guler I don't actually think anyone said that so I'm maybe I'm putting artificial words in people's mouths but um, I do also like the idea of just having him play really well at Real Sociedad in a team that fits, a team that suits him, a team that plays through him, get to develop there. I'm not sure if we would have seen him get to this level at Real Madrid because of the playing time issue. And we still have some rights about him. Like you wrote about, it's a little bit fuzzy what the clause exactly is. Do we have rights to first right or refusal to a sale? Or, you know, maybe yeah. you can explain that. I was looking bit. into this this week and it's funny. You, you read the Basque uh, newspapers and they play down the, the clause and you read the Madrid newspapers and they big it up. It's somewhere between, it's a bit different from the Odegaard thing, but it's basically a right of first refusal um, and apparently has an expiry at some point. But either way, it's like a lot of this stuff is kind of gentleman's agreement anyway. Like, yeah. I think it wouldn't take much convincing uh, of Kubo to go back to Real Madrid if, if he reaches that stage and wants to. And all these things are, like you say, they have a good relationship with Real Sociedad. And I think it's, it's quite clear that if they decide at some point they want to cash in, um, they would speak to Real Madrid to have 50% um, of the sale anyway if um, if they sell to, to a third team. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. It's like, it doesn't have to be right now. It's, you know, 
Uh, and would he would the best thing for him and maybe Real Madrid in the future be that he stays at Real Sociedad and continues developing there and having fun and we get to see him week in week out instead of him being on the bench? Yeah, like everybody wins right now with this except for whoever plays Real Sociedad each week. Yeah, and we've so had a good Real Madrid and they still they managed. Well, still. we have we've had a couple um, good situations this season where we've had good performances from these players. We're keeping tabs on. Plus, we won. Ariba scored against us. We beat them. Mm -hmm. Kubo doesn't score, but has a great game, and then we beat them. Um, this really felt like a, a game of two halves in every single stereotypical sense. You know, everything from Real Sociedad losing a step in the second half, Kubo not being as good as he was in the first half, Fran Garcia totally turning around in the second half. A lot of these things happen. Um, Jose Lu um, coming good after getting scrutinized by fans at halftime. I don't know if you're aware of what's happening at halftime because you're, you know, you're right there in the stadium. Not really. You're probably not just... really, but I can imagine the open goal crossbar sparked yeah. um, a bit of a debate. Which, yeah, like you say, I guess he fixed it in the second half, but um, no, completely different. And <laughs> it's what, like, yeah, it's a cliche. Oh, a game of two halves, the team got better. But you're right; you can actually see the game of two halves in certain individuals, like the ones you mentioned, Hosselu and Fran Garcia, in particular. Like they're just individual turning it around in the second half um, kind of decided the game. Yeah. Um, you think back to most of those problems, they were defensive. I mean, mm. I think the the combination of Kubo on that wing plus Fran Garcia and Tony Cruz, who wasn't really helping much tracking, uh, it was a bad, bad combination for Real Madrid. And also uncharacteristically on the goal we conceded, um, too many just stops tracking Baranechea mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Maybe he just, I don't know, the sense of urgency just wasn't there for him. Carvajal was left with two players. Poor Kepa is left on an island and um, saves the first shot, can't save the rebound. So that was like, I, I would pin that one on too many, but, you know, because he's been so good this season. But at that moment, I think he needed to react much better. So I was thinking, like, how long will Kamavinga stay on the bench in a game like this? Um, him and Modric eventually came in, but I don't know. Was there anything else in that first half that caught your eye that you know that 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 I could mean, have improved? Yeah, like the midfield in general was just really just. I mean, I know the idea. I guess was against Real Sofia that they're good in possession. You're going to stand off them a little bit, and you're not pressing like crazy. You're letting them. Uh, get to a certain point. Just even Bellingham's position, you could see, was so much deeper than he's been in other games. And you know, okay, fair. That's the that's the tactic. But just really, just lethargic from the midfield, and um, a little bit strange that to me, completely the Camavinga Cruz. Um, I think that's now like the main. Um, assuming everyone's healthy of the of the non long term injuries, I think that's the main question mark for most games. Is we kind of know the starting living right now. But it's, is it Cruz or is it Camavinga? I think that's kind of the question mark for most games. And yeah, I, I thought this was a, a Camavinga kind of game, you know, um, especially with Kubo coming into this one. And Tony Cruz maybe more suited in the Champions League in midweek. But I don't know, maybe the thinking is, well, Cruz has been there throughout the entire international break. He's fresh, he's ready to go. He's been there working with Ancelotti every day. Camavinga's just come back. Maybe that's the thinking that you don't need to rest Cruz in this game. But just stylistically, I thought Camavinga would have um, been a lot better option. And by the time he came on, it was a different kind of game. So we never, we don't actually know the answer to this. Uh, if Camavinga came on at the break, um, maybe that would have answered some questions. But by the time he, he came on, it was a different game anyway. So we don't really know how it would have gone if he'd been there. But a um, bit of a strange one. But anyway, um, changed that halftime with, I mean, I guess a team talk and a different attitude, but a goal ch goals change games. And, you know, if they hadn't scored as early as they did, who knows if the same pattern would have continued until the subs in the minute 60, because I don't think they would have come earlier than that. Yeah. I mean, we've we've seen also so many times with Real Madrid going into halftime and then coming out in the second half without any changes in personnel, but uh, a completely different performance. So... That was always going to be on the cards. And also, like, yeah, yeah, to your point, Fede scored so early in the second half. Uh, Sam Leverage wrote about our managing Madrid. I think it was the s fastest one since Bale scored in 2018 after, like, 20 seconds versus Alaves mm. out of the gates. And 
Yeah, I mean half the half the fans missed it. Like mm. in the like <laughs> the, the fans the, in front when of the, the, the camera, like pan, pan to the celebrations. There was like half the stadium was nobody there. was there. Yeah. Nobody was there. Like you just saw empty seats. People coming back and like turning to the press area to try and catch on the TV. It's like what no, do guys, people come on. do at halftime? I, I'm right. always bewildered because I I don't understand like where these people like masses whether, they just leave and they they miss it. Like what are you guys whether doing? I'm there for work, whether I'm there for work or for pleasure, going to a football game, I'm like. I've come, I'm I'm watching every minute of this. I'm not missing yeah. any of this to go and get a hot dog. I'm not if I need to pee. I'm timing it well, and I'm getting them. Like even like leaving before the end of a game, whether you're winning or losing, as a St. Martin fan in Scotland, I've seen plenty of. We're down four 0 at home. It's like, well, look, I'm sitting till the end. Like I'm not missing a minute of this in case a goal of the season happens to make it for one. Like whether it's work or pleasure, I'm not missing a minute. But it's amazing the amount of people who come back so late from. Um, from half times, especially half times of games, and yeah, that's when you looked around and uh, kind of just to see the reaction. You know, you're watching the pitch, you see the goal go in, you look around, you're like, hang on, where where is everyone? Even in the press box, <laughs> half the seats were empty. So, choosing to buy a hot dog when you bought a ticket to a Real Madrid game and missing a goal has to be top five worst decisions some a human yeah. can make in their life. Like if, a, like a just, shitty expensive hot dog. Let's underline this it's, for the listeners. It's like pig I know in in a in a blanket of carbohydrates. What like, are you doing? It's not even going to be good. Like just for the list. Like I know so many of the listeners are planning. Like want to do the bucket list once in a lifetime. Hopefully more than once in a lifetime trip to the Bernabeu. If when you do it, like <laughs> don't bring bring a pack of like candy or sweets or something Some for halftime sweets. if you really need. Like bring something you can bring with you. Um, bring the pocket deal, but don't don't be missing any minutes, um, especially when Valverde's on the pitch and well, and Fran Garcia comes back out uh, revived. I do think the bathroom breaks are a killer, and mm. that has to do with like you know a lot of these fans are just drinking all day before the game. They mm. have to yeah. use the bathroom. The bathroom cues are insane at halftime. So there's got like people. Anyways, my these are <laughs> completely <laughs> uh, ridiculous tangents. Um. So, right, second half, Fetty scores right away. I was going to say, like, even it's funny how little moments like that can just also just change and swing the momentum. You know, maybe Fetty scores before halftime or he scores right after halftime. Maybe Joselu scores. Maybe Joselu's shot goes under the, the crossbar and goes in. And, and the complexion changes. Uh, nevertheless, uh, that, I think, was a huge turning point in the game when Fetty scores. And... Obviously, one of the oh, I just wanted to mention one more thing before we dive too deep in the second half. Five game, five games in now. Carvajal, his fifth consecutive, really good game. I thought he was awesome today. Like for even the first half when things were not going well, he was a standout to me. Like his energy, um, some of his touches actually felt like oh, this is kind of peak Carvajal, where he like just somehow gets to. A ball that's out of reach or like overhit to him. Um, the way he was able to just work hard to get to those balls should have had an assist. Uh, I thought his defending on Tierney was really good. Um, his his really only one mistake I would say is like the Bryce Mendes had this really beautiful pass behind him in the second half, which I think Kepa comes out to punch, mm. uh, and Oyar Thabal fluffs it. Luckily, like usually Oyar Thabal I think would would have done better with that, but. We got lucky, but like, what is it? Is it really the gluten free? Is that what it is? Should we all just get too. off gluten? I don't know. Like, let's give it a few more games and see. I do like gluten, so um, let's see. Uh, I wrote about this too. Like, I was really interested in this game in particular. We we kind of have done. I can't remember. I think we had the Almeria post game podcast, and we're like, ah, Cover House been good for like two games in a row. And it was like, yeah, that was newsworthy at that point. I was like, let's see. It's you know, there's like seven days between every game at this point, let's see. I was really intrigued about this one because this was the first time where he played midweek. He played mm. both games of Spain, full 90 yep. minutes, which I was a bit surprised about. Yep. Um, okay, the Spain game was on Tuesday. It was against Cyprus. This is Sunday. He's had plenty of time. So this is still kind of like a five-day rest, not a three-day rest. But yeah, he's starting to play like the full, the season's properly started schedule, which basically begins from now, where you're playing... Sunday, Wednesday, Saturday, Tuesday, like it's it's nonstop now till the next October international break, which for him isn't a stop. So um, I'm going to be interested to see what it's like on Wednesday. Does he play on Wednesday? Maybe Carvajal is like, look, hey, Ancelotti is um, 
uh, decides that midweek Champions League game, like maybe Carvajal, like we can rest him against Union Berlin and Lucas Vasquez can do a good job. Like that's why I'm going to be interested to see the rotation. And if there is a lack of rotation, can he keep it up? Because if he can keep it up, I guess that means that it's the gluten free thing and he's back to his best. I mean, he is only 31. It's not like, you know, he's like, you know, some Tom Brady, 45 year old eating, you know, spinach. And it's like some, like, like he's 31, like, you know, how many 31 year olds can still perform at like the level they did three or four years ago? And it's kind of nothing with Carvajal. I think it's just that we did see a drop off physically, not technical, not tactical, not attitude, motivation. It was physical, like not the injuries, not really, I'm not really talking about that. Just that when he is fit, there was uh he got fatigued and right now he's not. So let's see if it can uh, sustain the schedule of every three day. Well, that, the way he explained it, it seemed to be like, it actually, it really seemed like the, the gluten was affecting him. I mean, obviously, for the majority of the people, there's nothing wrong with gluten. Like, you can eat gluten, it's fine. Some people are just a little bit sensitive. Some people are obviously very sensitive, and, not just, and, and some people are actually very allergic. So it depends on the person. But he, the way he explained it seemed to be like, it's just easier on his joints. Like, he, you know, less inflammation, less on his joints, and... Like, we don't need him to be necessarily peak Carvajal from 2016. But if he can just be, like, what he is now, and if there's a little bit of a drop-off here and there, that's okay. But I think, like, if he just, as long as he stays healthy, that's a huge, huge positive for Real Madrid. So, shout-out to Carvajal, who... Because, you know, the, my my skepticism came in the form of two things. One is what you said, that once the schedule gets more intense, midweek games, that's how is that going to affect him? And the second thing is... I don't know if he's necessarily faced a great winger yet. Mm, With all due respect to, I mean, who? Well, today was Baron and Shea, but, yeah. um, you know, like, it's true. Um, Kubo was, like, maybe the first, like, real deadly, deadly winger, and that was on Frank Garcia's side, so he skipped that. But, you know, those, um, that'll come. Um, yeah. Well, uh Union Berlin have Robin Gosens, who is a solid attacker on that left side. Uh, okay, so, yeah, second half, Fede scores, complexion changes. Fran Garcia, what was your assessment of his performance? So, I was already starting to write about him at halftime in probably not a positive way. The question I was more thinking was, okay, Mendy's back, basically, from midweek. Mm, does Fran Garcia need to up his game? Like, I'm I'm a, more of a Mondi fan than mo- most, I think. Um, you know, I think he, when he's fit and healthy, but like the Carvajal conversation we just had, when he is available, um, he's a lockdown defender. Like, few, few, few wingers are getting past him. And I think offensively, he can contribute a bit more than people think if he's in the right system, in the right um, scheme, if he develops well with Nicious, which he was doing. Um, I'm more of a Monday fan than, than most so my question was look okay Frank Garcia is a starter now but only because he's been the only left back all season what is Ancelotti's thought on the Monday versus Frank Garcia debate we don't know yet so I was thinking okay maybe he needs to, to up his game and maybe he had the exact same thought downstairs in the Bernabeu because he comes out and okay the first assist is, is mostly you know 90% Fede Valverde just leathering it through the post and then but he does tee it up absolutely perfectly. Fede doesn't have to think about it. He doesn't need to adjust his run. It's, it is, you know, some of these simple assists are, you know, uh, a little bit more complicated, a little bit more about the timing than, than it seems on the TV when we're sitting watching it from the sofa. So, um, you know, it was a decent assist, bo- mostly Fede's. But the cross for the second is superb, and it's exactly it's what we knew he could do, what we saw at Rayo. And it's like the textbook, Fran Garcia to Osalu assist that when those two players came, into the squad in the summer, knowing their characteristics. I think that was the kind of play you envisage in your head, and that is exactly what uh, what we saw for the second one. He's also, I mean, he had, so he had two assists today. Like you said, the first one is, you know, it's just, it's, it's a regular pass at Fede. Um, I mean, it's mostly Fede. The second one was a perfect cross. And do you think back to, like, moments where... And this is why I I tend to look at expected assist numbers more than assists, just because like you think back to the the really good play against Getafe where Jose Lu misses 
that Fran Garcia does really well to set up. And um, I, I and on that note, I do think, I mean, one of the first of all, if you have Fran Garcia on the pitch, I mean, you you kind of saw like some of his defensive issues today. Although, like the effort is there, and he mm-hmm. did. I thought he read the game well in certain moments. He had three interceptions and. I only have two of them in my notes. I don't know what the third one was, but the two that I have was like he actually read it really well. He stepped up. He anticipated the pass. And <clears throat> so he, he can read the game that way. And the effort is there. I think some of the defensive things, one is like he, he could have helped, had some better help. But I also think he gave Kubo too much space in some moments as well. Um, but I do think having a striker like Jose Lu on the team benefits Fran Garcia. Because one of the, his favorite things to do is just like, as soon as he gets the ball, look up and just whip a cross in, a dangerous cross. And like not having, if you don't have Jose Lu on the field, it kind of, uh, it's obviously not as complimentary in that situation. And Ancelotti said after the game that Jose Lu was a striker, the kind of striker we haven't had in, in years. And obviously, he's referring to, I'm sure, the target and the, the aerial ability that he has. So I, I do think a couple of things with Fran Garcia. One is that I think you need someone in midfield, you know, along with Chu many that can help defensively in that situation. Um, and the other thing is that Jose Luz's presence, I think, helps a lot for, for his crosses. There's there's a Hosel comment I'll I'll get on to a second from the press conference, but just to finish on Frank Garcia, you can tell that the Bernabeu loves him. Mm. There was a moment in the first half where he played a back pass similar to the back pass that went wrong against Atafi. There was nobody there this time. This time it was the exact complete um, pass to make, completely insignificant pass, but he chased it down. He does it kind of not looking or you know really quickly get the ball away. There's no one there, and the Bernabeu really applauds and cheers that. Mm. Really for 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 like what what just I was like ah okay yeah that is actually quite similar to the Taffy one and it's is this just a way of reassuring them making them like you know you are like back passing is is okay like in a certain moments just you know don't pass it straight to Taffy um or to Alaba and put them in a complicated situation so it was just like a little moment like that where you're like okay like they they want this guy to succeed they're rooting for him. Um, and they're like applauding the most minimal thing just because this time, um, you know, it worked out well. And then the other one, which was maybe one of the inter- interception or tackle, uh, it's quite hard to see from, from where you are. But the piece of play in the second half, when Real Sofia had have the ball for ages, just passing it around, passing it around, the crowd's starting to get a bit annoyed. This is between, this is when it's 1 1. And Real Madrid are sitting off. And it's Fran Garcia who finally goes in, lunges in, wins the ball back. Then goes out for a throw, I think. Um, but he just breaks up that piece of play where Real Sociedad are, are just controlling possession. Real Madrid are happy enough to do that, but the fans, of course, are. They, you know, it's Real Madrid are playing at home. You don't want the opposition to be the ones having the ball. And Frank Garcia goes, breaks it up, and and wins another round of applause. So those are two moments that, like, you can tell. Ah, the, the crowd really likes this guy. And um, yeah, uh, just to go on to the Hosolu thing, there was an interesting comment that Ancelotti made where he said, you know. Um, it's no coincidence that he's scored two goals at home because at home, these are the kind of games where we're going to have a lot more crossing into the box. We're going to be closer to the opposition goal. And hmm. it's no surprise that Hostelu is getting these chances at home. Hmm. And it made me think, ah, maybe like this is kind of the the plan is when they're playing home games, when even a great team like Real Sociedad are going to play a little bit more defensively at the Bernabeu. Everyone does at the Bernabeu. You're going to have chances. You're going to be, if you're not winning, you're going to be camped out in the final third towards the end of the game. And you want that penalty box presence in these kind of games at home. And I don't know, I think Angelotti made it as just a throwaway comment, but it kind of um, raised something in terms of selection going forward that maybe Jose Luke plays a lot more home games and away games going forward. When Vinicius comes back, do you think mm. it's Jose Luke or Rodrigo who goes to the bench? I think also, um, I think, um, I mean, yeah, it's true. That's interesting because we haven't had a Vinicius home game when he's been available yet this season. So that's true. I think uh, the home, the starting lineup, I think would be um, Rodrigo on the bench. But yeah, I think there are maybe certain home games against, when you play Cadiz at home, when you play Hitafi at home, like when you play these teams with super low block, they're coming to the Bernabeu to try to get a nil-nil. 
Um, I think these are the games where Hossley will will start and play more minutes. And I think the um, you know other games away from home is more an emergency option off the bench if if you need to to revert to that kind of tactic. So um, yeah, I don't know if Ancelotti was trying to signal it, but just the fact he said you know it's no coincidence that he's getting these chances at home that he's scoring at home. And I think he he understands that home games for Real Madrid are sometimes a bit trying to break down the defensive wall, banging your head against the wall a little bit, um, because teams a lot of teams don't play against you at all. Real Sociedad were not that team, and I think uh, Ancelotti only mentioned that in the sense of once they had a lead, Real Sociedad they become a little bit more like that team. They have something to defend, but away from home, I think maybe it's they want a bit more expansive play um, than what Hostelu would provide because. You go away to most teams in La Liga, and apart from a few, those home teams will try to play. You go to Osasuna away, like they will try to play. You play Osasuna at home, they will sit back. What's your take on the Rodrigo slump? I mean, I don't. Mm. It's, I don't know if slump is the right word. It's only four games, and he scored one goal. He scored a couple goals with Brazil in the international break, but. I think, you know, relative to, I think, what people were expecting when Vinicius was injured of Rodrigo stepping up, so far it's been kind of underwhelming in the goal-scoring department. What What is your take on on what he's going through? Yeah, I mean, obviously scored in the uh, first half of first game of the season, hasn't scored or assisted since. But um, I looked at it for, like, specifically, like, since Vinicius went down, because I think that's when you expect Rodrigo to step up. And... Those last two games, those two home games, he's had 13 shots. He, yeah, you know, he had nine shots against the Daffy Four today. Like, it's not a lack of trying. Ancelotti pointed out he's getting into good positions. I maybe disagree a little bit with that, but we don't know what he's been asked to do. And I think I do feel a bit sorry for him. He's one of the players who only got back on Wednesday. So I think whatever happened today, you know he's getting a bit of a pass, but he's probably playing most of the game because there's not many other options. Uh I I think he's, you know, it's a brand new system. We we talked, we spoke a lot, didn't we, the first few games. It's a brand new system for Vinicius to try to get used to. Also for Rodrigo, it's a brand new system for him to get used to the diamond. And then as maybe he's starting to get used to it, bang, there goes Vinicius for a few games. And now you kind of change the system again. Okay, it still looks like a diamond, but the the front two or the front three, whatever it was before, is totally different once you have Hosselu basically being the replacement for Vinicius. So... You're asking Rodrigo to do a completely different task these past two games from the different task he was already asked to do the first three games. Like it's confusing. Like I, I, I think he, like it's hard to know where he's supposed to be, and I wonder if he fully understands what his role is supposed to be. Like I'm, I'm willing to give him a lot of slack for, um, yeah, what I guess we can call a bit of a slump. Yeah, you mentioned the, uh, the shot volume, uh. Only Lewandowski has shot more hmm. this season. And uh, that's actually, those numbers are before today's game. I don't know how much that changed today. I, th- I think Rodrigo actually leapfrogs Lewandowski because th- this counts Lewandowski's game yesterday. I guess so. It was four, yeah, four shots today, so I guess so. Yeah, so he sh- has more shots than anyone in La Liga this season so far. And I say that almost like, as a compliment rather than, oh, he only has one goal from 20 shots. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah cause, cause the reason I say that is because I think, um, to me, that means at least he's not being shy. Like, he's not disappearing on the pitch in that sense. Like, you don't know where he is. I agree that he maybe looks a little bit, you know, just trying to figure out his, his position, his role. There's been a formation change. But he is getting chances. He is not being shy about it. And you just hope that, you know, eventually the goals will come. Uh, I thought, I've seen a lot of people kind of just down on him and say, oh, maybe he's not good enough to start for Real Madrid. Maybe he's not as good as we thought he was. I'm not there. I, I think it's a little bit overblown. I think he'll be okay. Um, I just see good signs from him. I think maybe you could argue, like, sometimes he can pass. Maybe in that on that chance where Jose Lu hits the crossbar, Rodrigo can leave it mm-hmm. for Bellingham to pounce instead of trying to bicycle kick it miserably maybe moments like that yeah i agree like maybe he needs to let the game come to him a little bit but i i i feel like it's more uh it this this little patch is not something i'm not i'm necessarily worried about that's all and this champions league in midweek he'll score like his usual champions league hat trick on on wednesday the champions league will be good for him i think 
Um, that's his competition. Hopefully, that'll uh, help his confidence. Um, okay. Um, where where do you want to go from here? I mean, so yeah, we kind of. <laughs> I mean, we got us a bit sidetracked there with linking Frank Garcia to to Jose, but we we're discussing the second goal, and then I guess um, that comes in the 60th minute, and then you have the final half hour of the game. Which what was interesting was Jose Lua immediately gets substituted off. You know, he scores a goal and immediately yeah. comes off to innovation. And, you know, Ancelotti was asked afterwards, but I think we already knew the answer was, were you planning to take off Jose Lua before um, he scored? And I think that was quite clear. Like, um, the substitution, the board was already ready before the goal went in. Like, um, right. So, uh, you know, they were they were planning to take off Jose Lua, which is interesting in two senses of why did you want to do that when you thought it was 1-1? And then why did you still want to take him off when when you'd scored? And he outlined that he said, you know, I think uh, at that point, Real Sofidad were, were really dominating the midfield. We needed an extra midfielder. Um, he brought on Kamavinga and Modric for Jose Lu and I can't remember who else went off. One of the midfielders. Uh, Jose Lu and Chiumeni. And Chiumeni. So, um, yeah, um, you know, uh, gaining one midfielder from that substitution. And Anzati thought, OK, like, um, just because we now have the lead that, logic is is the same we need to we need to get players in midfield yeah uh i would say he struck gold with jose lu scoring right before that happened Mm because that was massive and i think like the 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 remaining 30 minutes were largely uneventful i mean there were chances here and there but you know it was kind of boring which i think was fine it was suited real madrid for a boring close to the game uh and then essentially what happened when jose lu comes off um is that you have, well, eventually you ended up kind of with Brahim and, and Bellingham up top, who nearly combined for a beautiful goal at the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, Fran Garcia, uh, and then Ancelotti obviously starts making it a little bit more conservative. He takes off Fran Garcia for Nacho. Fran Garcia also gets a nice ovation from the crowd. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I don't know. There's not a whole much else to it i don't think it was like a really like con- considering how like defensive with defensive problems of the opening like 12 minutes of games for some reason the end of the game was was perfect and the headline i put for the the, the press conference piece was and Totti was asked look towards the end you know like you got quite defensive and he says yeah like we have no problem with playing a low block and counter-attacking like we right. have absolutely no problem with this like at that moment of the game we had to defend that's what we had to do um, he explained that after the goal they went to a four four two, um, and then towards the end they they went even more further back and made it a four five one with I think Brahim just up top and it's like, yeah like you know you're playing Real Sociedad they're a good team you have the lead like you have some of the best defenders on the planet some of the best defensive midfielders on the planet like don't overcomplicate it like there's certain games at home where I think even the fans allow you to do that when you're playing a good team like Real Sociedad and they just want they're just like you like let's defend and, and get this um and get the win. That's pretty much part of the course for Carlo if he's winning. Um he, he doesn't really care necessarily about racking up the score more than he does just preserving a lead and, and coming out with a W. You had enough I think like you d- they defended well apart from that one sequence where Kepa has to punch and then uh, you also had a chance to make it 3-1. Like, you you had enough. Um, and also, like, I was thinking, like, if you... What's the worst-case scenario? If we, if we, like, concede after Fran Garcia comes off, probably a natural solution to maybe restore some of the attacking abilities. You could just switch Nacho and Alaba. Put Alaba as an attacking mm-hmm. left-back if you need to in that situation. Have Nacho in the middle. Um, so, uh, Brahim... Feels like mm-hmm. he does at least one thing every time he comes on. I was really impressed with his run and his pass to Bellingham. You know, it was a it was a great run from Bellingham off the ball and the ability to get his head to it. But it was a really great because the way Brahim had to get the ball to him, he had to loft it over a couple of defenders yeah. to make sure Bellingham gets to it. Do you think uh, Brahim deserves more playing time? I mean, I think like yeah, I'm a little bit surprised he hasn't played more. I would be cautious, though, of you could look at 
like um I don't know what stat we want to call it, but like this things, you know, this things per 90 minutes, it would be way up there, you know. Yeah. Um, but we do have to keep in mind he is coming in at the time when the game is broken down. Real Madrid have won all of their games. He tends to come on when they're winning already. Yep. Um, you know, um, apart from like the Hitafi game, they've had the lead quite early, early enough on um for those final minutes and that's when the opposition is really going for it and there are those opportunities at the other end it's it's chaos it, so you know he did well like he looked composed he terrorized like you could tell that real so that defense was 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 scared every time he got the ball mostly because at this point they're the only ones back there because they're sending everyone forward to chase the game so i don't know i would be a bit cautious about over hyping what brahim has done because he's doing it against um teams that are chasing the goal but I do think, yeah, he does deserve more, more, more time. I'm surprised he didn't get as much time, especially with Vinicius being injured. Like you count up his minutes, and uh, which is like again, you do need to count all the stoppage times that he's played, which which don't always uh, show up depending on where you where you get the minutes uh, stats from. But like, yeah, I'm surprised he's not played more. Maybe the midweek game is a is a good one for him to. Uh, to perhaps start, you know, Union Berlin are a good team, but like home game in the champion, like I always say this every year is, you know, you lose, um, you drop points in La Liga on September 17th, you're two points or three points behind when you count the table in May or June. You can lose to Sheriff Tiras Paul and still win that year's Champions League. That's happened. Like the group games in the Champions League are a good time to rotate, to experiment, to give players these starts. Uh, you're not throwing away a game, probably still win it. But like, if you know you do draw with Union Berlin at home on Wednesday, it's not a disaster, and you can fix it and still qualify and go far. So I'd like to see some some of these players like Brahim get uh, get a chance to 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 start and not just come on for garbage time uh, on Wednesday. So I'll take the W. I was devastated that Bellingham didn't get his goal at the end to continue his score, scoring yeah, streak. Yeah. Uh, but I thought I was thinking about this because obviously he continued it against Scotland, though. And... <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah, as 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 you know, um, devastating game for you. But it was just a friendly. Who cares? Um, but I, I think with with um, Bellingham, this was a quieter game by his standards. <clears throat> Still did some good things, I thought, but the. Um, I, I always knew that it wasn't reasonable to expect him to score at that rate that he was scoring at. And he still got a goal per game, even despite not scoring today so far. But I think it's reasonable for I, not to sustain a goal per game average. Obviously, I think that would be insane. But but I think like it's reasonable for him to have put up some a decent amount of goals this season. Because he's he's so good off the ball, his understanding and instinct of just showing up and getting like one to two clear cut chances per game, and obviously he's not playing too deep this season because we have a million midfielders and Ancelotti needs him higher up the pitch. So he's gonna get like one or two clear cut chances per game, and he's gonna I think put away a good amount of them because he just understands where to be. Like he has that knack. So I feel like I don't know I don't know exactly how to put a number on it, but if someone asked me, like, you know, gun to my head, will Bellingham score 20 this season? I think I'd say yes. Yeah, I mean, I think he scored 16 last year with Dortmund. Like, he's, mm. you know, he can do this. He's already off the flyer. He almost scored again today. Like, and this was against a team with a higher defensive line. Like, it's a bit, it's not really, he likes to be, as weird as it is, like a bit of a penalty box poacher. Like, he comes in from midfield and he knows where to find the space in the area, where to get his shot off from. Real Madrid just weren't as close to the area as they normally are. So, like, this is, you know, the kind of game a bit more difficult for him. He has more work to do um, deeper because Real Sofidad had uh, control of the midfield for a point. And he still came so close to scoring, you know, one, maybe two goals. Like, so, yeah, like, no, you're right. Like, I don't know what the number is. Um, you know, that's a really interesting one to try and guess at this point. But, um, yeah, he looks, every game he looks like he could score one or two goals. And that's, um, I don't think that's going to change. Um, anything else from this game that uh, we didn't address? Um, I think that's maybe most of it, yeah. 
I mean, yeah. it's like post post international break game, especially September one, is like players are tired. They're, you're still getting used to the season. Like you've got to just take the win if you can get the win. Like you know, look at Atletico. They they go to Valencia and lose three 0 Like you know, you got to come back from international break and just mm, get the win. And when you're playing a tough game like Real Sol with that, you know, can't have many complaints. Even if this was far from perfect. Here's what I learned from Sam Leverage's uh, stats mm. piece after the game. I always learn something new. Yeah. Uh, Jose Lu has scored in all four of his uh, in all four of his Bernabeu appearances as a Real Madrid player. Mm. So also scored season, there in his last Espanol one at the end of last season. As a, well, yeah, but as a Real Madrid player, mm. so to this season. And then two in 2011. Um, so the stat goes all the way back to 2011. Back to the Angelotti comment. Like, I think Jose is going to be the Bernabeu hero and then just like sit in the bench when they, they, they fly off to Canarias or whatever. Yeah. Uh, you also wrote about closed roof versus open roof. Mm. It was open roof. I don't know what the, this, I don't know what the parameters are that they're going to used to decide honestly i don't think like rain is going to be like the reason why they i think they just closed it last time because it was ready and they wanted to show off like which uh, is fair enough um but wasn't it was, also was, the weekend of the the massive rain where atletico had to postpone their game yeah i mean that rain never really came to the center like um okay. but on this that was on the sunday um but on the saturday yeah there was some rain but like not much like today there oh, was some different rain. days yeah. Okay. Um, today there was a bit of rain. Like, I would say the, the same amount of rain as the day they closed the roof. The day they didn't. Like, I think the first one was like, look, the roof is ready. Let's, let's show this off. But I wonder going forward, like, what the rule will be, like, when they'll close it, when they won't. Like, I don't know. Um, I mean, the Bernabeu, the, the Bernabeu is like still very much like <laughs> in work. So there's like, there's dripping water, like, in front of some of the fans, like on some of the fans in front of the press box. And then today when I arrived, I was in the lift with, with one other guy and, you know, it's on the eighth floor and we're on the first floor. We start going up and by the second floor, the lights just cut out, but the lift keeps going. And I've never been so happy to just like reach the eighth floor. Of the <laughs> you guys were just us. in the dark. We just, we looked at each other once the lights came back on and we could look at each other. We were like, okay, let's get there. Let's get the hell out of this. <laughs> And then when we were going back down, made sure to avoid that middle one, and actually it was out of order because some, yeah, the lights aren't working. Yeah, yeah, I know. So yeah, it's very much a work in progress. But um, that's what we, you it's can not, take it's the not stairs, right? Oof, I mean, eight floors. I don't know. Like, On the way down after the game, I never get in the elevator. I'm like, I'm, I'm just yeah. walking down, guys. See well, it's eight there. floors, but then to get to the press room, it's ten floors because the press room is on minus two. So then that, that is a lot of stairs and it takes a while. So. Um, I just took a different lift and survived to make it here to tell the tale. Um, any any other updates with renovations and the press, like and specifically with the press? I mean, the yeah, they have like new music on the in the lobby when you first go in. It's like some sort of like live lounge kind of acoustic singer songwriter vibe. Oh, live music. Which, well, not live, but like you know, the, like the live lounge kind of CDs they do, like you know, like some like acoustic hotel lobby. singers. Yeah, kind of like some singer-songwriter, like kind of covering like a song, but acoustic style. They have like that, which really clashes when someone then opens the door and you can hear, you know, like Bad Bunny just blasting through. <laughs> so I don't know what they're going for there. Um, I mean, it's like, I think they're still finding their feet, like, and I'm working it out. But uh, just the last one on the Bernabeu, like the the minute silence before the game, like um, last night, like uh, Pepe Domingos Castaño, who's like a legendary uh, Spanish radio presenter, he passed away. And um, as you'll know, like, our, like if you turn around from where our seat is, it's right in front of the uh, Cadena Cope radio cabin. And he was, you know, like basically um, as much of a franchise player for them, uh, as you could be, he was the face of that channel in their sports coverage for years. So, um, you know, that minute silence was weird. I could see a lot of people looking around. Them. Was, oh, yeah, they're looking to to look and see how they're, I don't know, experiencing the minute silence. I don't know. Mm. Like, just, you know, look, you know, just observe it yourself. But um, no, like an emotional moment, that one in the press area, because, um, you know, uh, he was one of the, you can just see, I think, today with some of the, the tributes, like uh, one of the guys that kind of, mm, 
you know, uh, built the current Spanish uh, media landscape for all its all its good and all its bad. But um, so yeah, rest in peace to him. That was a a moment at the start of the game that you could definitely feel in the press area was uh, that one hurt. Rest in peace. Um, so this is five wins out of five now. Can't mm -hmm. ask for a better start. I think we can nitpick some of the things, you know, bad start, putting our chances away better. Defense needs to improve. In the end, we've had so many games where we play well, we don't get the points, and we complain about that too. So ultimately, the, what matters the most is getting the three points at the end, being at the top of the table, and that's where we are right now. So whatever happens after mm -hmm. this, I have no idea. But so far, so good. Hopefully, we can continue this until Vinicius comes back. Mm -hmm. And this is the beginning, right? Even of two week, two games per week for the foreseeable yeah. future. Until the October international break, it's you know yeah. Champions League this week, uh, midweek La Liga, the derby next weekend. Yep, um, it's intense. But uh, you know, classical end of October. Um, that's confirmed already now. 28th it's it's a busy time but yeah five wins like you like you say you can't you can't do better than that Real Madrid also won the first five last season and then it fell off in January so um you got to keep it going but like five wins playing the first three away from home as well mm -hmm. um new system like yeah perfect yeah uh and obviously the derby is always and you know at the Metropolitano it's not an easy game just put it that way um, so Ewan just wanted to give, uh, just the, the listeners some, some housekeeping. We were pretty active this week on Patreon. We did not put many, I don't think we put any free shows per week. Maybe, maybe, maybe one free show last week. I can't even remember, but most of it was, you know, live calls and mailbags and other stuff on Patreon. And, <clears throat> uh, this week we're doing one more free show on Tuesday, but then tomorrow, Lucas and I, El Dia Después, that's only for patrons. Wednesday, Union Berlin post-game show, only for patrons. Uh, mailbag in person, Lucas and I are recording in Madrid on Friday. That is only for patrons. You and you're welcome to, to come along too. And we also just launched YouTube members for those who can't access Patreon because of the country they reside we have youtube memberships you can go and pledge there it's all in the in the show notes it's the same content so we also wanted to give a quick shout out to our ten dollar plus patrons because as you know if you pledge ten dollars or more not only do you get access to everything you also get guaranteed responses to your questions and you also get a specific shout out to uh you get a specific shout out on the podcast if you pledge ten dollars or more per month so shout out to these $10 plus patrons as follows, Brandon Alvarez, Willie Reed, Will Sousa, Wamik Jamal, Walker Kuvan, Tobias Royo Bacher, Tahmid Kalam, Sushank Damala, Sujai Wani, Somanchu Singh, Sheikh Hatiri, Sergio Arispe, Santos Solorzano, Samuli Jusin, Samar Z, Sai Mohan, Sasi Kumar, Rishi D, Phoenix, Peter Powell, Paulo Fierro, Oscar Barrera, Nico Laxo, Nicholas Moeller, Nick Ribeiro, Nelson Masariego, uh, Naveen Babu, Ramesh Babu, Mowgli, MJ Diego, Michael Zinberg, Marin Myrtle, Matthew Atkins, Martin Ridman, Magnus Lex, Logan Stahl, Leon Stavronakis, Kunal Tilikar, Kevin Rivera, Jose Osorio, Jose Cruz, John Fernandez, Jeff Sowa, Jason Fitz, Jacob P., Ian Marley, Howard Moore, Graham Gerard, Gary Cohut, Frederick Rantakiro, Frederick Sundros, S.A. Davisito, <clears throat> Eloy Enriquez, Edward Sossman, Daniel Williams, Connor McMorrow, Christian Toff, Christian Acosta, Brendan Powers, Brandon Stevens, Arnab Mukherjee, Armand Gashi, Armando L., Anthony Tharp, Andres Silvestre, <clears throat> Ananya Kumar, Alex Steiberg, Azaz Hussein, Adar Zalukovic, Adam Dorsey, Bella Chow, Varun, Ramtin Makhrur, Primo, Fabian Moreno, and Daniel Smith got through it before my voice blew out. Ewan, thank you for your time. Thank you for all the great work you do on site at the Bernabeu and for managing Madrid. Appreciate it. Have a great night. Buddy. Always a pleasure.